Welcome, everybody. My name is Anagshma Abusa. Um, I'm the director of the Weiser Centers, and it's my pleasure to welcome you um, to our conversation on Europe. Um, and today, we're welcoming Jeff Kopstein, who is a professor of political science and the director for the Center for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies at the Monk School for Global Affairs at the University of Toronto. Um, before coming to Toronto, Jeff had been a professor at the University of Colorado at Boulder um, and at Dartmouth College after receiving his PhD from the University of California at Berkeley. Um, and Jeff has a storied career in political science. He is the author and editor of three books focusing on political economy, institutions and identities, and the relationship between America and Europe. His work has been widely published in the top journals in political science, um, and he's the author of a very impressive over two dozen articles. I was here. <laughs> um, and he's a rare scholar because he has the creativity and the flexibility to move among topics rather than mining the same seam um, as so many of us do. Um, today, he will present findings from an extremely provocative and fascinating new book project um, co-authored with Jason Wittenberg about ethnic politics in interwar East Central Europe. And specifically, the book is called Intimate Violence, Anti-Jewish Pogroms as a Prelude to the Holocaust. Um, and from this project, we've already seen articles on ethnic identities and electoral politics, party po um, politics, and popular protest and violence. Um, so today, please join me in welcoming Jeff to our conversations on Europe, and we look forward to his talk entitled Intimate Violence, Popular Jewish Riots in Occupied Poland. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you very much, Anna, for that uh, very generous introduction. Um, I thought that especially the say, saying that I don't stick on the same topic for very long was a nice way of saying that I can't pay attention to anything for very long. Um, so um, let me, t I'm going to tell you a little bit about this project that I'm, I'm working on, and I hope not to speak too long. And um, let me, let me tell you, let me start at the beginning. Um, give you a bunch, some information that you already know. Most of you. June 22nd, 1941, the Germans um, initiate Operation Barbarossa along a 1,500 mile front running from the Baltic to the, to the Black Sea, um, invading areas that had been occupied by the Soviet Union starting in 1939, uh, the Baltic states, um, e eastern Poland, um, western Ukraine, and uh, parts of Romania. And um, as they invaded, they passed through quickly. So let me, they passed through quickly. And for the most part, um, they, uh, the, the military units uh, don't stop. They push on and they roll very, very fast. And they're trailed by, as you know, these mobile killing units, the Einsatzgruppen, um, who are charged with rounding up communist, Jewish, and enemy elements, and, and in the first instance, shooting them. The problem is, is that for the most part, the Einsatzgruppen couldn't achieve this task from the standpoint of the Germans. They were, um, especially in the first days of the war, there were just not enough of them. There were only in total a couple thousand Einsatzgruppen members spread out along a very, very large, large front. And so in the first instance, what they wanted to do was to get the locals, and this we know because we have the documents. Historians have found the documents, to get the locals to carry out um, self-cleansing actions, you know, Selbstreinigungsaktionen, right? And so this was the idea. They most, for the most part, failed at doing this, right? In only about 10% of places of, uh, on, on that entire uh, first part of the Eastern Front, from running from the Baltic to the Black Sea, did locals engage in pogroms. And indeed, the Germans complained. And they sent back um, um, uh, reports to headquarters saying, we couldn't get people to do this. Right? In those places that, where this did occur, um, we do have reports. The most famous of which is, of course, Jan Gross's book, uh, Jedwabne, about the town, um, the eastern Polish town um, in the Bialystok region, um, Jedwabne, where, in Gross's words, one half the town killed the other half of the town. Now, every single part of Gross's account has been questioned by historians. And this is good. 
This is what historians are supposed to do. And they have, this has produced a giant outpouring of scholarship within Poland, including um, a, 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 um, a two-volume book, both of studies and documents, Wokoll Jedwabnego, which is you know, about all the areas around Jedwabne. And I'm going to talk a little bit about today, that today, because that in, we incorporate some of that uh, those findings into our, our research. But we're really interested in so I wanted to start at the very beginning of here. We're calling a pogrom, Jason Wittenberg and I, only those instances in which the locals do it. If the Germans come into a place and kill everybody, we're not calling that a pogrom. And that's confusing because, it's slightly confusing, because in some survivor accounts, they call that a pogrom. And we're, we want to make sure that it's only, we're interested in the question of the neighbor's question, right, in, in Jan Gross's words. What are the circumstances under which locals do this or, for the most part, don't do this? So we start with this question, why, did, why were some communities toxic and others weren't? This is a pretty old question. Um, why pogroms occurred in some villages and not in others. Um, my favorite account was that of Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, who, who in his classic lecture on East European Jewish life, given in 1945 at YIVO, right after the Holocaust, which he gives in Yiddish, and he speaks of a village in 1918 that was repeatedly passed over in a pogrom wave, and he attempts to explain it. And of course, it's Heschel. So he explains it in religious terms. Right? It could only have been some form of divine intervention. Um, and he, he invokes a, 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 a Hasidic Rebbe. And it's a, it's a beautiful story. I'm a social scientist. And so I'm turning to the tools of modern social science in order to understand it better. I'm not claiming to understand it better than Heschel. <laughs> but I'm going to use these tools in order to try to get at it as best we can. So we start off by asking, what kinds of places were these, were these towns? And did they differ in any systematic way from the others where they did not occur? That's what a social scientist does, right? You start looking for some kind of variation. Here's the map, of course. This is the territory we're talking about. Um, and just to, you know, this, again, this is the a kind of crowd which I assume will know all of this to begin with, but just in case you didn't. Um, so let me talk as a social scientist about hypotheses. Why did this happen? Why did these pogroms occur? The most natural explanation, and the explanation indeed that's in a lot of the accounts, is they killed us because they hated us. And why did they hate us? Who hated us the most? Local extremists. And there were no, was no shortage of local extremists in all of these territories. In Poland, by the late 1930s, the National Democrats, known, in, known as the Endecia, in reference to N and De, um, elements of it fl certainly flirted with fascism. What prevented them from being outright pro-Nazis, for the most part, is that the Nazis also hated the Poles. But their anti-Semitism was very sophisticated. It was a very sophisticated analysis of the role of Jews in Polish society. And they wanted to be rid of the Jews. They especially resented Jewish uh, competition in urban areas. They tended to be an urban movement, not a rural movement. Um, they were sober, in the, not in the sense of alcohol, but I, I mean in the sense of non-romantic. They had a very a, a social Darwinian view of the world. Right? The Jews were despised not because they were religiously Jewish, but because they posed an obstacle to a modern, urban, normal Polish nation. Right? That's the best spin I can put on it. There were other fascist movements, of course, in the region, some, some really much closer uh, to fascism. Um, the organization of Ukrainian nationalists, which actually invaded with the Germans, wore Wehrmacht uniforms, were trained by the Germans. There were units incorporated into, into the German military, um, hoping that the Germans would give them their own state. This never actually happens, of course. Um, 
The organization had been formed in 1929 to oppose moderate Ukrainian nationalism. The moderate Ukrainian nationalists actually got along with the Jewish and Polish populations fairly well. Not always easy, relations were never easy, but they got along fairly well. Then you have the LAF, a, a Lithuanian fascist group, which was much like the organization of Ukrainian, uh, uh, Ukrainian nationalists. Um, they were sponsored by the Germans. They invaded by the Germans. They wore German uniforms, carried German weapons, and, and, and followed German orders for the most part. And then in the Romanian areas, we have the Iron Guard, which all historians classify as a fascist movement, um, which also wanted to rid uh, Romania of, of, of Jews, to, in, the, in the words of Vladimir Solinari, to purify the Romanian nation. So that's the first explanation that's out there. So you would expect that those places where these movements were the most strongest, that's where you would have the pogroms. Then political science actually has a whole series of, of, of hypotheses, and I'm going to run through them quickly. Electoral incentives. Some people look for, especially those people who study India, look for kind of ethnic outbidding during elections. And you would expect that during elections, that's when you would have ethnic violence. The good news is, for the good news, for analytically, there were no elections at this time. This was during the German invasion, right? So electoral incentives don't exactly work, though I'm going to show you a lot of electoral data here. War, the Hobbesian theory. Ethnic cleansing tends to occur during war because war brings out the worst in people. It gets rid of the moral, the residual moral restraints that are otherwise out there in society and allows people to act on their worst instincts. This is probably true. The problem is, is war was everywhere. It can't explain the 10% because it's pervasive. So while it may be a necessary condition, in the words of political science, it's not a sufficient, clearly not a sufficient condition. The Soviet occupation. Indeed, the Soviet occupation exacerbated ethnic relations, and the Soviets had occupied the territory that the Germans had invaded from 1939 to 1941. They destroyed civil society. They imprisoned or, or deported Polish and Ukrainian elites. And in the days just before the Germans invaded the N in the NKVD prisons in the Ukrainian areas, not so much in the Polish areas, but in the Ukrainian areas, they massacred the Ukrainian prisoners. And it is true that where these pogroms happened, oftentimes, though not in most places, there were NKVD prisons discovered by the Nazis as the Nazis invade by the Germans. And then they use these to, to start pogroms. But pogroms did not only occur there. And I should also add there were Jewish victims among these NKVD uh, um, prisoners as well. There were Polish, there were Ukrainian, and, 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 and Jewish victims. So again, the biggest problem is that the Soviet occupation is everywhere. It's like war. It can't account for why Pogroms occurred in some places and not others. There's no evidence showing that the Soviet occupation was any worse than where pogroms occurred than where they didn't occur. So again, I think it's very important. I think the Soviet occupation is crucial. It's why pogroms don't occur in the western part of Poland. In the Poland, part of Poland occupied the central and western from 1939 to 1941. And why, indeed, they don't occur east of this uh, band occupied by the, Soviet, by, the, by the Soviet Union from 39, 41. So clearly, this band was very important that the Soviets had occupied. But that alone can't count for the spatial, the geographic distribution, why they occurred, why those places, and not in others. Then, of course, there's Judeo-communism. The, the Polish word, the Polish expression, Zido Komuna, which is, you know, pretty much exists in almost every language in the region. Um, it, in Kami Jew, in the case of the United States, it exists in this region too. As a matter of fact, I published an article several years on this, ago on this in Slavic Review, where I wanted to call it the, the myth of the Kami Jew, and uh, the, the, the editor wouldn't allow that title. Um, so you chose a much more boring title, which ensured that nobody will ever read the article. Um, so the argument here is that the Jews were disproportionately communist. 
and, and disproportionately had been um, sympathizers of communism <laughs> since the founding of uh, independent nation states in this region uh, from 1919 on, and in some cases since the Bolshevik Revolution and even before that. What can I say about this? Here's what I can say. Number one, from an electoral standpoint, the Jews did not vote for the communists. Our calculations in the case of Poland show that only about 4% to 6% of Jews voted communist ever. The, most, the highest vote for the communists actually came from Belarusians. Now, what about, you would say, well, what about the leadership? The leadership was disproportionately Jewish. This is partially true. This is partially true. It was disproportionately Jewish. What I would say is that it was disproportionately ethnic minority wherever you go in Eastern Europe. Why? Because the communists promised a world in which solidarities would no longer be based on ethnicity, right, but on class. But the fact of the matter is that the Jews did not support communism any more than anywhere else. And, and you're going to see when I show you the results, you're going to see a highly ironic effect. Then the last hypothesis I wanted to mention was pre-existing polarization. The argument here, and it's really there are twofold. One is where Jews dominated commerce, that's where you would get the most anger, the most the, when dominated commerce back even into the 1920s. That's where you would get the most anger, because the pogroms show, the, 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 the testimonies show that looting was an important part of these pogroms. And then, of course, there's political and cultural polarization. In those villages, the hypothesis goes, where Jews and Poles lived in different cultural and political universes, where they didn't associate with each other, where Jews did not wish to become Poles, and Poles did not wish in any way to associate with Jews, that's where you would get, under the right circumstances, war, Soviet occupation, all other things. The stars had to line up in a lot of other ways. But in those places, that's where you would get pogroms. So I'm going to present you some data in a minute. But I wanted to actually read you about a real pogrom. So this is a, a little known one in um, Szczecin, in northeastern Poland. It occurred on June 25th, 1941. And I, I have two parts to this. And I'm only going to read you the first part. I'm going to leave the conclusion. That's my, 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 one of the punchlines in the conclusion. June 25th, 1941, on Shabbat. The testimony, there are multiple testimonies for this one. This is by Chaya Soika uh, Golding. Um, here it goes. They hung up their swastika flag, the Germans did, and they pushed on. The city lay in chaos. Authority, authority passed into the hands of the Poles. This lasted about two weeks. All kinds of rowdies were let out of prison. Dombrovsky, Yak Yakubczyk, the well-known Polish arrestees under the Bolshevik, Sviatlovsky, the chief of the guards, and Yankelitis, the director of the school, and others. They were full of rancor for the Bolsheviks and the Jews. Friday night, June 25th, when the entire city slept quietly, the slaughter began. They, the Poles, had organized it very well. One gang in the news section, a second in the marketplace, a third on Lomzer Street. There in the news section, they murdered Romorowski's family, the tailor, Esther Krieger, your neighbor, with, this is a letter that I'm reading from, your neighbor with the youngest daughter, Sora Belech, and I'm reading the, a couple of other names from the yeshiva, all in their own houses, and many more. They killed Rosenthal's children in the marketplace. They also killed Heitschke with her six-month-old child at breast and her older boy, Grishin. Later, the squads divided up the possessions of their victims amongst themselves. On readied wagons, they loaded the corpses and led them outside of the town. The goyim immediately washed the bloodied floors, including the stones on the street. A few hundred sacrifices had taken place in one night, and still, the murderers informed us, the massacres would continue for two more nights. The elements are all there. The Soviet occupation, the collapse of authority, the riot agitators, hatred, fear, the rage of the nationalist crowd, the thirst for revenge, blood, booty, and ultimately the intimate violence are all contained in this short narrative. 
don't let me forget to finish this narrative, because I'm going to switch back now to why does this all occur? Well, let me tell you about my data. The data is mostly drawn from archives, from memoirs, from German documents, from Yusker books, from memorial books, which were written after these, these events by the, by the, 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 the survivors of, of uh, these communities. The best by far, however, and a really an un, a, a, a source which can still be tapped, and it's a fascinating story in itself, is the, Polish, is the Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw, Zhi, Zhidovsky Institute Historyczny. And there you have 7,200 testimonies done mostly from 1945 to 47. And then they trickle in after that up until today, up until today. The ones back then are mostly in, in Polish, German, and Yiddish, and some Hebrew. Uh, but you have other languages as well. And the ones today, you get them from Los Angeles in English. And they tend to be, the, the ones today tend to be very long and drawn out. The ones at the beginning tend to be 12 pages long, sometimes 14, sometimes much shorter sometimes by children, 14-year-olds. There's fascinating correspondence from there. They were worried that there weren't enough. At this time, in 45 to 47, they didn't know if there were any Jewish children left. They were worried about that. And so there's a whole story to be written about taking these testimonies. Um, they were done, obviously, with a great deal of care, uh, sensitivity. There was, a, there was a questionnaire they were using, because the, many of the same the, 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 the testimonies show that they were, they were answers to the same sets of questions, which make them largely comparable. Um, they were done in different times and different places within Poland. There doesn't appear to be coordination of stories. So as, as with all survivor testimony, it helps to have more than one. It helps to have two and three. Right? There are contradictions in the stories. Right? So this is all true, and I don't want to deny any of that. But this is the best we can do, I believe. You can go and find some of these stories repeated in the Yad Vashem archives. I've gone there as well. I find the Yad Vashem testimonies not as helpful as these testimonies. Right? The Yad Vashem testimonies come from a later date. Sometimes they contradict the earlier testimonies. Not in the basics, though. Not in that a pogrom occurred around this date, and a lot of the time, the same names are, are mentioned. So the dependent variable, that is what I'm trying to explain, what we're trying to explain here is where the pogroms occurred. We draw from the narratives mostly from, and you'll see why, mostly from eastern Poland, from the Bialystok region, Polesi, Volhynia, and then the Galician, the Ukrainian areas. Tarnopol, Lv uh, Lvov, and Stanislavov. And I'm, I'm using the Polish spellings even without the diacriticals because I wrote this up fast. I can switch it to Ukrainian. It's not a political comment. It has to do with the nature. The data is all drawn from Poland, from Polish sources. I want to know the characteristics of the locality. So draw on two things. One is census data from 1921 and 31. Who lived there? What religion they were? Um, um, the socioeconomic makeup of the area, literacy. And then I want to know what was the, the political culture like in the region? So what we do is we draw on two, the only two basically free and fair elections in Poland's interwar history, 1922 and 1928. The 28 election occurred after the Pilsudski coup, but it was still basically a free and fair election. Basically, there was some pressure in the East, but not a lot. And the pressure was mostly against the communists. And we actually have, from the archives, the votes that they showed what the real vote was, as opposed to the falsified vote. We found that. Actually, Tim Snyder helped, helped us find that in the military archive. For purposes here, we group the parties into blocks. The communists, the non-revolutionary left, the supporters of Pilsudski, and most importantly, the supporters of the National Democrats. And then, of course, Jewish parties. And I'm going to talk about those two. And we group the Jewish parties. And Svi will probably disagree with my grouping of them, but that's, that's completely cool. We can talk about that in a, in a couple of minutes. There are limitations. The limitations of the data is that we're explaining what happened in 1941 by reference to data from the 1920s and 30s. Right? It's the best we can do. 
It's the best we can do. The good news is people didn't move a lot around. There, there, were, there was very little exit to, to, to uh, British Mandate Palestine at this point. The big era of emigration to the United States was over. There was very little labor mobility. You didn't sell your apartment and move to the city for the most part. The area of high urbanization was largely over in Poland. There was a hiatus at any rate. It would continue after the war again. So I'm not so much worried about that, that people who we find in the village are different 10 years later. I'm not so much worried about that. The proportions stay the same. And we have, in fact, a control census. A Ukrainian sympathizer with the Nazis carried out a 1939 census from Galicia by asking Ukrainians in camps who lived in your town. And in fact, the, they agree the 1931 Polish census and the 1931 Ukrainian census at about 0.94. It's, it's OK. I'd like it to be better than that, but that's what it is. OK. So again, the areas we're dealing with here, if you look in eastern Poland, you see, um, start from the bottom, Lvov, Stanislavov, Tarnopol, Volhynia, Policia, and then cutting into Bialystok. We don't have good data on the Nova Grudek. And, um, and, and the, um, um, the Vilnius region, which is an interesting lacuna, which I can talk about later. So here, I'm going to present. I, I know this isn't. I didn't. I got confused about what Anna wanted me to do. I know this isn't a statistics crowd, so I'm not going to. This is actually really easy. Here, this is simply averages. Sorry, these are medians. Medians, right? Call them averages, OK? I mean, for this purposes, it doesn't matter that much. They're medians for pogrom locations and no pogrom locations. So you see, we have 56. If you go to the very bottom, N, 56 places had pogroms. 296 didn't. So this is northeast Poland. This is the Bialystok region. That is where Gross talked about. And it's Polesi, which is a Bielor mostly a Belarusian region. Now, there are three sets of, of, of variables here. Three sets of variables. One is, what you can see is that clearly pogroms occurred where more Jews lived, right? Now that's kind of duh, in, in one sense, right? That's kind of obvious. It's not so obvious, however. There's a whole strain of literature which argues that ethnic violence is much more likely to occur where the victims are powerless. And they're more likely to be powerless when there are fewer of them. Why, why wouldn't have? these Jews been much more easier victims, much more easy to find and to kill if there are fewer of them. In many of these places, half the population, nearly half the population was Jewish. See, that's 41% compared to 3%. Let me push down to the next category. What we have here. You have the first, the sec next category is the party vote. So the first one is, the first party there is a, is a orthodox Jewish party, right? Mainstream orthodox, but very orthodox nonetheless, tended to team up with Jewish merchants, the Agudas Yisrael. Um, and you see, indeed, they tended to get more votes, right, where Jews lived. Not that surprising. The next, the minorities block. The minorities block in this region tended to be, um, it was almost all for the most part, in the area that was heavily Jewish, um, um, Yitzhak Grunbaum's um, uh, central Polish general Zionists. Right? They were mainstream Zionist party. And that is a huge difference, right? 22% versus 1%. Then we have what is the interesting variable which this is the one that was most shocked me. The difference in the vote for the nationalists is just not that great. It's there, but it's not that great. In fact, the nationalists were pretty strong everywhere in this part of Poland. And so the nationalist vote, the Indecia, it's true they were stronger where pogroms occurred. Then let's go to the communists. Indeed, there is a difference, but it's an exactly the opposite, the opposite of what you'd think. Where the communist vote was strong, and I have to say one thing, this is a proportional representation system. 12% of the vote is a good vote. It's a very good vote. This is a country in which you had 32 or 34 political parties at an election. 
to, so to get 12% is a good vote. So indeed, there is a difference. But where pogroms occurred, the communist vote was low, not high. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Finally, what we do here in that final set, those final three things, we assume, we make an assumption. Now, I don't think this is a big deal, that only Jews voted for Jewish parties. And we make another assumption, that only Poles voted for the Endetsia. We make an ecological assumption. So if you say the maximum vote, the maximum Polish vote for the Endetsia is not a function of the total number of people living in a village, but the total number of Poles living in a village. Then we make a different set of average estimates here. And indeed, the, the differences are stark in the Jewish vote. I would point you especially the Jewish vote for the minorities block, which is a Zionist, mostly a Zionist vote. In those villages where the pogroms occurred, the Zionist vote was especially strong. There is, again, this difference in the, in the Endetsia vote. That the Endetsia vote is also stronger, though not as strong as I thought it would be in the pogrom villages. So this is the vote from 1928, I should add. Now, now I'm going to put up a table, which I know you're not going to get, but that's OK. You're just going to have to believe me I'm right. Oh, no, did I? Did I not? Did I do something wrong here? Ah, there it is. Yeah. This is what you call a logit regression, right? And a logistic regression. And what you're trying to do here is to figure out is the variables that interest you, are they the variables that interest you, are they still powerful even considering the presence of the other variables? And again, it's pogrom or no pogrom. And what you see here is by the little stars. You're looking for the stars, right? And I'm going to tell you what the stars mean in a minute. But indeed, if you look at that first column, the Jewish vote, the number of Jews multiplied by the Jewish vote for, for Zionist parties is highly significant. The Jewish vote for the, sorry, the, the, the overall communist vote in a village, not the Jewish vote, but the communist vote in a village is negatively significant. It's negatively correlated with pogroms. It, apply, it appears to have given robust and continuous immunity from pogroms occurring in a village. Illiteracy also comes up as statistically significant. That is, the poorer the surrounding area was, the more likely you were to have the desire for booty. That's our, that's our interpretation of this. OK. And the second, is, the second column is a, sorry, the third column is simply a, a, um, a, a, a test of this with a different set of data. And it comes up basically with the same results. It allows us, we we, by um, um, including more data in that there, from when there was missing data in 28, we included 1922 data, we could get more data points. And you could, you could re-estimate it just to see if, if the, the results hold up. And indeed, they do. So I'm going to go back, because I put the slides in the wrong order. Now here's a different table. I need to tell you about this for one minute. I'll be five more minutes, that's all. This is, one, this is the vote for Pilsudski's party in 1928. Pilsudski, after the coup in 1926, decided he was going to run one last free and fair election to try to get a parliamentary majority. And he fielded a party with the acronym BBVR, which has the creepy name, the non-party block for cooperation with the government. It's like a Putin-esque party. It really was kind of like a Putin-esque party. There was mild amounts of pressure applied to vote for this party. But the hope was, Pilsudski was an authoritarian, but he was not a racist. He was not a racist. Pilsudski's hope that Poland could be rebuilt on a non-national democratic basis, he hated the national democrats. They were poison for him. And he wanted to get Jews and Ukrainians to vote for him. And indeed, they ran in 1928 on a platform which would basically guarantee Jewish civic, uh, civic rights 
and communal rights, not autonomy. That was beyond what the Pilsudskiites wanted to do. That, that was an earlier, earlier Pilsudskiite plan, which they never followed through on. And so here what we do, this is simply an estimate. These are estimates, ecological inferences. This is actually rocket science. This is my co-authors doing. Um, of what percentage of each group voted for the Pilsudski's party in both pogrom and non-pogrom locations. And so what I want to point you to is not the Ukrainian results. Forget about that. I want to point you to uh, the, Jewish, the Jewish results. And this is true across Poland, where the Jewish vote, well, sorry, in this area where the Jews voted for Pilsudski, the Ukrainians interpreted that to be that the Jews had sided, had sided with the Poles against the Ukrainians. Because Pilsudski was perceived by the Ukrainians to be a Polish party, the Pilsudski's BBVR. In the Polish areas, however, in the Polish areas that were, that were Polish and where there were no Ukrainians, where the Jews voted for more strongly for the Polish parties, the Poles perceived that as Jewish integration. And there was actually much better relations in those communities between Poles and Jews. So that's the middle row there, the, the difference in the vote between 9% versus 18%. 9% where pogroms occurred, the Jews voted for Pilsudski's party, and 18% uh, voted where they did not occur. OK. Again, this is the, these are the same results that, I, that that table of averages I showed you before. From Polish areas, this is from Ukrainian areas. This, look at the highlighted numbers, essentially the same results. That is, pogroms occurred where a lot of Jews lived and where those Jews voted for Zionist parties. And there, here the results are, if anything, even stronger. Again, the same result. These are the, almost replicating the results, except there were many, many more pogroms in the Ukrainian areas. So if you go back to the last side, slide, you'll see that there were 120, we found 124 pogroms in the Ukrainian areas. And in fact, we're underestimating it. We, we're, there are many places we mark as a zero that were actually a one. So I want to quickly conclude. Let me conclude with, first of all, by finishing up the testimony, which I said I would conclude with. So what comes next after this pogrom in Shuchin provides the crucial permissive communal context in which the pogroms could occur and deepen. So she continues, those remaining were stricken with fear. What do we do? How can we save ourselves? My mother ran to the priest to beg for the Jews. They offered no help. With Hannah, Liebel, Zemel, and Salen and the other Jewish women, I ran to the Polish intelligentsia. There, too, we found no, no salvation. My mother, with two other women, ran after help to Gryova, a nearby town. They did not let us into the town because of the curfew. What do we do? Night was falling upon us. Approximately 20 Germans entered the city, a field troop. We were afraid to show ourselves before them. Then, and I, then I had an idea to try our luck with the soldiers. Maybe they would help us. With great difficulty, we chose a delegation and departed. The group of Germans consist consisted of soldiers and two officers. In the beginning, they declined to help us. This is not our business. We're fighting on the front, not with civilians, they explained. However, when we offered them so soap and coffee, they softened up. They guarded the city at night, and all remained quiet. I, with two other women, began to work for them. And later, we were placed to work in the German headquarters. And so, in this matter, manner, the pogroms in Shuchin were stopped for a while. The Germans stopped the pogrom.
The passage indicates strongly, and I think the data supports it too, that what allowed the pogroms to get off the ground and intensify was not merely hatred, hostility, rage, all the things that Roger Peterson has identified in his work, but also a crucial emotion which Holocaust historians have underlined and I think we as political scientists have not paid them enough attention to, and that of course is indifference. Indifference of key members of the po local Polish community towards the fate of the town's Jews. Shushin's Jewish women expected something different. Their first instinct, once they had understood their predicament, was to turn to the priest and the intelligentsia, and this comes through over and over again in the testimonies, whom they believed would have stopped and could have stopped and sometimes did stop the bloodshed. But neither the priest nor the intelligentsia, a broad category in Eastern Europe that includes everybody from lawyers to veterinarians, were moved by the frantic appeals of the petrified Jewish women to intervene neither lifted a finger or showed any signs of solidarity with their fellow citizens. The women did not count hatred in their marches. They reported no reaction, no help, no salvation, unquote, nothing, unquote. They met indifference. Whether, whether they also offered soap and coffee to the, to the Polish intelligentsia. And you just think about whether so women offer soap and what time of day do women offer soap and coffee to men? I don't think it's at 7 p.m. at night. It is also difficult to determine whether the town's Polish spiritual and educated elite set the tone for the pogrom or merely reacted to the context in which they lived. Our, st our statistical analysis, however, points to the context. In Chuchin, a town where 50% 50 50 of the town's 4,000 inhabitants were Jewish, 88% of whom voted for Jewish parties in 1922, and 85% in 1928, and where the communists attracted a mere 2% of the vote, Jews and Poles were already polarized, and the stage was set under the right circumstances for a pogrom. So my conclusion, number one, I do not wish to blame the victims. That is not what I'm talking about here. The Jews, by virtue of the fact that they voted for Zionist parties, are not to be blamed for the fact that pogroms occurred. I'm simply trying to talk about the context in which they occurred. Indeed, these parties wanted to serve in government. To be a Zionist in 1920s Poland was not necessarily to believe, not even majority would believe, that they would leave the country. It was about a new kind of Polish-Jewish politics. They would have gladly served in, in cabinets. There was not one minority member of any Polish cabinet in interwar Poland, not Jewish, not Belarusian, not German, not Ukrainian. I think what this really points to, what I'm trying to say here, in those places where the Jews and the locals in our data voted for the same political parties, you didn't have a pogrom. I'm talking about the bare minimum of solidarity. You don't have to like them. I'm not talking about like. I'm not talking about love. I'm not even talking about respect. I'm talking about the bare minimum of solidarity that can prevent this kind of thing. It doesn't take much. And I think a lot of the research on other pogrom, other areas, um, in other areas of the world on ethnic cleansing proves this. It also points to the importance of what, of what others have called political assimilation. Where there was even a modicum of political assimilation, those Jews who were voting for Pilsudski, they were not necessarily liberal Jews. Many of them were Orthodox Jews. We know this. Many of them were Aguda voters who decided that they were going to support the powers that be. This was the bare minimum of, of, of political assimilation. I don't really have time to talk about the Greek and the Hungarian cases, but I think this is also borne out there if you look at the pattern of which Jews survived and which Jews didn't. The Jews of the countryside in Hungary versus the Jews of Budapest. The Jews of Salonika who did not survive versus the Jews of Athens who did largely survive. And the differences in both political and cultural assimilation in those groups. We can leave that for the Q&A. What's also true is that where more Jews lived, Jewish parties were stronger. Where they were stronger, pogroms occurred. This perhaps points to limits, the limits of multiculturalism. There may be limits to political absorption within multicultural societies. This is more of a, 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 a sore point in a Canadian talk than it is in an American talk. Right? Canada has an ideology of official multiculturalism. And, but we don't, we in Canada, I would say, have kind of fake multiculturalism. We don't have 
groups of people who actually often don't share a common language. We actually in Canada have a regime of draconian linguistic assimilation around English and French. You don't have to learn English and French. You're also free to go sleep under a bridge. In Poland, you really did have groups who frequent, frequently could not even associate with each other. I think ultimately, what I've come away from this whole study thinking is that where pogroms occurred, the Poles and Ukrainians did not necessarily hate the Jews more than where they did not occur. It's just that you could not get that bare minimum of someone to come along and say, no, we're not going to do it. And I think where that did occur, where they did say, no, we're not going to do it, you had, it was easier for those people, those brave, to stand up because the communal context was very different. So I think the study points to a very important questions of most people look at, at um, rescuers, those who stopped atrocities, as acts of individual heroism. Indeed, they are. But it was easier to be heroic in some circumstances than others, in some villages than others. What does this mean for Polish and Ukrainian wartime culpability? It's interesting. I'm only pointing to 10% of places where this happened. In most places, it did not happen. So that story is, in some ways, good. My story also takes a lot of the heat off, off the most radical nationalists, because I find very little correlation with radical Polish or Ukrainian nationalism and where pogroms occurred. Of course, on the other hand, there always is another hand. Um, it may put the focus then back on ordinary people. Away from, you can't just point to a small radical group of nationalists and say, it's their fault. It probably, such, the guilt such as it is, probably has to be spread more evenly in Polish and Ukrainian societies. This is speculation, but I think it's an implication. So on that note, I thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take your questions, comments, and criticisms. Do you want me to field it, or do you want to field it? I'm happy to field it. Yes, please. Yes, and I'll, I'll re I'm going to repeat questions I've been told to for the filming. I found this fascinating in terms of uh, the methodology to add to knowledge about this. Um, and I'm asking the question, the um, My first question is about the 10%. What is that based on? Is it based on the population? Is it based on you know towns? Right. Um, so that was my, my okay. first basic question. Um, should I, I'll ask the, well, I'd like to make a few other points if that's okay. Um, sure, of course. So my second point was about um, the question of, you mentioned how many Germans were in a specific town. Right. And this was the, one of the issues that, that was found to be on the so Right. I wanted to see if there was any uh, correlation or, or comparison of that. Um, and then, in terms of like the correlation between who voted for what party, right. m my immediate reaction in the system is just a you know, sense is that um, in a town where there was a higher communist vote in this sort of arc, um, anarchic period, uh, right after you know, the German invasion, communists would be more likely to sort of take unofficial control, maybe, or to just, mm -hmm. uh, they'd be more likely, more less likely to carry out the wrongs, right? Mm -hmm. the communist ideology. Right. And then in terms of Zionists, well, um, perhaps more anti-Semitism or difficult relations before the war actually was what helped to, to, to move Jews to resign. Right. And then my last point was just about the different wartime context, the different military context between like northern eastern Poland, um, right. southern, southern eastern Poland, and then Hungary compared with Budapest. Yes. Budapest yes. Countryside. Yes. Um, and so that you know, uh, those are, that would also. Okay. <laughs> Those are all really good points. Um, the 10%. So let me tell you about the nature. And Anna had, in her introduction, mentioned the, the articles that have come out of this so far. So what we did years ago, it's been too long now, um, we got grants and we gathered together census data for Poland and electoral data for Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, uh, Bulgaria. We tried to get Romania's. Uh, we've got the census data, but not the electoral data for every single settlement. And we entered them in a database. Right? And so in the case of Poland, we have you know, all 3,000 villages in Poland. 
right? Um, in the case of Czechoslovakia, it's more like 3,500. You know, there, there are some, there are a few that we don't have the data for because Poland had these things called Abshari Dvorskia, which were these estates. They were kind of, you know, uh, big estates where you had a bunch of people living on them. We don't include those, but it's actually not, it doesn't contaminate the results because no Jews live there anyway. Um, that was all, these were Polish and, and, and uh, um, Ukrainian peasants. In the case of Czechoslovakia, it's 15,000 villages and cities, right? So you can, we had armies of research assistants entering this stuff, right? So we're talking about the 10%. We're talking about in that area, area that the Germans invaded um, in um, um, 1941, there are about 3,000 places. Some of them are cities. They're municipalities. They're, in, the case of, in the case of Poland, they're called gminy. Um, in, the case of, uh, in the case of Czechoslovakia, it's, it's Abtsi. Um, and uh, the, German, the German map, they're, they're the best map we have is actually a German map. The German Ostforschung researched this really carefully. Um, and it's a Gemeindekarte von Polen, right? And so it's, it's got every little tiny Gemina. And so we have, we have all of that. Um, so that's the 10%. 10% 10 is three, if a pogrom occurred, it gets coded a one. The town, by town. There are problems. Let's full disclosure here. Sometimes, sometimes um, pogroms occurred. The same people who carried out a pogrom in one place went to the next town and carried it out there, right? The, that's mostly what the Germans were trying to do. That's what the Einsatzgruppen tried to do. They did not have the resources to carry out pogroms everywhere. It was mostly two or three guys in a car who would go to a village and say, you're free to do what you want. But this gets at your next question. We have, in our pogroms, the evidence is pogroms occurred before the Germans got there, when the Soviets left, while the Germans were there, and after the Germans had left. So the one I read you about from Chuchin, that's after the Germans had left. Um, they show up again in the evening to stop it. Right? Um, and indeed, the pogroms were mostly stopped by the Germans. Now they come back. This is, in the whole era that I'm talking about, this is very important. It's six weeks. It goes from June 22nd to July 31st. After that, there are no more pogroms. The, what happens in August and, and August and September is the Germans come back and kill everybody. Right? That's when the pits start. The thing that Tim Snyder talks about, things that Tim Snyder talks about in his book with the shooting in front of pits, that's August, September, October. Right? Those are the big actionen. I'm talking about the era before that happens. The Germans didn't know what they were doing yet. They really wanted to get the locals to do this. The evidence for that is totally clear, right? all the way up the ladder. But they just couldn't. Um, the communists. I totally agree with you. I, I mean, I didn't have time to really give my interpretation. The interpretation here is that what communism was in interwar Poland, it was the only party, apart from the Pilsudskiites, in which Jews and non-Jews got together. Pepeis. What? Partially, but the Jews did not vote at all for the PPS. Some of the leaders of the Pepe, some of the people in parliament were, were Jewish, but the Jews, our data shows the Jews were not voting for the PPS at all. It was perceived to be a Polish party. And indeed, the PPS were, were happy that the Bund was there, right? And they didn't want the Bund to cease to exist because under certain conditions, the Bund and the PPS could collaborate. You're not completely wrong, but I think on the, on the level of, of big mass behavior, this, the PPS, the, the, the socialist, the Polish Socialist Party, was a, a Polish, perceived as a Polish party. Um, so let me just answer her last question, and I'll, I'll, I'll come to you. Um, the disposition of the military. It basically goes like this. The farther north you go, uh, the easier time the Germans had it at the beginning of the war. They move faster. As you get into Galicia, the res Soviet resistance is stronger, right? And they actually have to move um, troops from the northern areas to the southern areas to, to attack through Galicia. But this does become important. As you move even farther south into um, the Stanislavov, into the regions that border Hungary, where Hungarian troops show up, they do not allow pogroms. They're venal. They steal. Right? They take Jewish possessions, right? but they don't um, allow pogroms. Right? Um, for whatever reason. I'm not, you know, I, again, I'm not trying to talk about moral superiority. 
But in, in Stanislavov itself, the, the, the Hungarian troops prevented a pogrom. You, I wrote down Zionists here, but I just don't know what you said. I can't remember. Yeah, did, was the Zionist vote already a function of previously existing violence? Not Good violence, ethnic relations. Ethnic relations, yes. Um, a, I don't know. Um, but what I have, what I do have, um, we have, there were pogroms that occurred in this region from 1918 to 1920. And we have that data from YIVO. If you look at the, the Cherikov archive, it's an amazing untapped resource. There's great dissertations to be written out of that. I mean, it's not untapped, but, you know, Henry Abramson used it in A Prayer for the Government. But, you know, I think that it, it's, it hasn't really been conquered, that archive. And he listed all the places where pogroms, all the people, it did amazing research. Where pogroms occur from 1918 to 1920 don't map perfectly on our, they don't map very well, I would say, on our pogroms in, um, um, in 1941, suggesting that the Zionist vote was not necessarily increased by the previously existing violence. Now, violence isn't the only reason for a Zionist vote, right? Uh, Right, yeah, it, it gets complicated, and there's only so much, I can only start the story at a certain point, right? And, um, you know, the interesting thing would be, what's, what I hope people do with this kind of study is they'll, they'll go back and do small town village studies. That's what this calls for. You know, I have some, I have some stories. I have lot, thousands of stories, but I don't have the deep, um, archivally based, you know, why did this Zionist party rise in this village and not the village next door? Right? And that's really where you'd have to go with this. Yeah. Thank you for your lecture. Um, to uh, your research, show, um, for example, you, you stated in one of your conclusions that uh, where there was large Jewish uh, locale citizen population with uh, uh, the other part of that, then um, there were pogroms. Uh, right. How much of that might have been due to what you would see elsewhere? For when citizens wrongly blame whoever it is that's in office or whoever is the ruling class or are perceived wrongly through propaganda to be blamed when there are like um, tough economic times. Right. And I was wondering in those areas where um, there were pogroms and wrongly blaming the Jews for their whatever types of problems, right. what were the economies like uh, in those particular areas? Okay. Second, um, as far as a gap um, that I, or at least a question that I have, that I was wondering if you could answer. Um, regarding your uh, slides regarding the economies and everything, how much of that could have been just um, due to the fact that no one knew that the Germans, when they invaded or when they were doing these programs, would be ultimately successful. They right. were scared. Right. Um, anyone could also speculate only that maybe at some point the Russians would end up controlling, not the Germans. How much of that might have just been out of fear of the Russians ultimately prevailing? Right. Okay, so the two questions were, to what extent was this kind of economically conditioned, and to what extent was it, a, was it conditioned by the fear of, the, the fear of the, either the Soviets returning or, or, or the Soviet presence itself? Um, a word about the economies of these areas. These areas were backward, economically backward. Um, the, the Jews in the 1920s constituted the, the small town commercial class in these towns, right? Um, they dominated. I'm not, these people weren't rich. They mostly had stalls. They were small traders. Um, they, many of them had loans. We also have data on uh, the, the, the Joint Distribution Committee, it's kind of a Jewish charity, set up little banks in many of these towns. And we have data on which towns had these banks and which didn't. Um, so you can actually code the, each town for that. And it doesn't come out perfectly. But indeed, I think what the, remember I had literacy, illiteracy came up there. I think that's very important. I think that, that illiteracy shows that the local population, because that illiteracy we know from political science and economics correlates with, with poverty, right? So. Where the population was poor, it, 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 relations were even more exacerbated. Now, it has to be said, however, that the Jewish, small town Jewish traders, the commercial class, 
um, became poorer over the course of the 1930s. As the Polish government put in place a set of policies that was designed to create a Polish bourgeoisie throughout Poland, Jews were denied access to um, uh, credit, which is why these, 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 the Joint Distribution Committee set up these Jewish commercial banks. They set up, um, they, they encouraged the setting up, the Polish government did, of um, cooperatives in order to avoid Jewish middlemen. And these policies worked. I mean, they weren't stupid policies. They worked. And so the Jews, by the time of the 1930s, mid to late 1930s, pretty regular reports were coming back from, from this area of Poland. And again, I'm saying nothing new here, nothing that Ezra Mendelssohn hasn't said a thousand times in his work, right? That these were, was, there was a process of pauperization going on, right? And so the, while the Jews were of a different class, they performed different social functions, I wouldn't speak of really rich and poor for the most part here. I would speak again of kind of different cultural worlds, right? Um, Fear. Indeed, there was a lot of fear, but the point of my research was to sh is to show that the fear was unevenly distributed, right? And where the communists were more powerful, there perhaps was less fear. Communism was a form of liberal, not, sorry, non-liberal universalism. Non-liberal universalism. And it's, it was the one, it was, it was one of the few things I believe that uh, prevented these, these pogroms. And I'm starting to find some, some, some corroboration for this and from some of the Ukrainian narratives, right? And it's been the hardest for me to get into. I think the Ukrainian narratives are the least reliable. I don't really read Ukrainian very well. Um, but um, I found some evidence for this that the local, where the, and there's very few cases of the whole local population rising up and preventing pogroms, and those are in the Ukrainian areas for the most part. Um, OK. Yeah, Anna. Oh, so Anna, then Svi. I'm sorry, I didn't see your hand before. Yeah. Um, so you know, as you stated, voting for the same parties is evidence of fairly minimalist integration. Minimal. Right? So how does then that translate into um, you know, opposition to or lack of indifference to pogroms? Yes. Right? That's a yes. pretty high standard. It is a very high but standard. It's completely compatible. You can vote for the same parties and then shrug your shoulders when your neighbors get attacked. Yes. Yes. Um, <laughs> it's a very political science question. You're asking for the mechanism. You're asking for the mechanism. And I don't, I don't have, what I don't have, here's what I don't have and what you want. You can't kill those Jews. We voted for the same party. It doesn't exist, right? Obviously, that's the smoking gun I wanted, right? I knew I wasn't going to find that. What are these elections? They're stand-ins for other things. Right? There's stand-ins for a general climate. Right? And the kind of, you know, you have Ashutosh Varshney's work on India, where he points to the importance of civic association, where Hindus and Muslims join the same civic associations. You don't get um, um, ethnic riots, he calls them. I'm not going that high. I think what we're talking about is even more minimal than that. Um, and what I believe is that when you, when you had where local Polish elites, and especially the Pilsudskiites, I think they're, they're the kind of one of the heroes of this story. And it's one of the heroes I think of a lot of my research. I'm trying to revive the Pilsudskiites. I think they, they, where they were able to selectively integrate, selectively integrate elements of the local population, you had much better relations. And I think the narratives do, play, do bear that out. Right? I wish I had public opinion data. Of course I don't have public. That would connect the dots. You want me to connect the dots in a way that I can't connect. I can't do it for you. Um, it's going to be a partial story. It's going to be based on these testimonies who, who said that, you know, in this place they liked us more, they cared about us more, they stood up for us more. And it just so happens in those very self-same places, my data bears it out. So those are the, that's the best dots that I can connect for you. Right? I wish I could do better. And with my co-author, my co-author wants to argue, ah, you know, who cares about the, who cares about the mechanisms? And I said, this, you know, you're going to go and give this talk, and the first thing the political scientists are going to want you to do is to connect the dots there, right? To have a clear line of causality between those elections and what occurs in 1941, and why this, why that, and why that. And all we can do is to try to draw out a little bit from what happens after 1928 with the local administrations, trying to integrate the minority populations 
in some villages, and to go backwards from 1941, where they talk about what things were like there under the Soviets, and in some cases before. And that's all we can do. It's, un it's, un it's, a, it's a limitation of the study. No one's done better, though. So that's, let's see. As a great admirer of your boring article on Slavic Review, <laughs> um, I have a couple of informational questions and then a couple of uh, skepticisms. Good. Um, you identified 3,000, you call them villages. Settlements. 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 In, yeah. And you say only 300 of them, or in 300 of them, pogroms occurred. In how many of those 3,000 did Jews live? No, it, it, has to be, it has to be above 1% or we don't count it. It doesn't count. But it could be 5%. Yeah, no, it could be 5%, yeah. Okay. And uh, uh, second question is uh, of an informational nature. What was the turnout, if you know, of the population in the 1928 elections, and what was the Jewish turnout? Um, I have it. Um, the Jewish, I, I can just tell you, right? The, um, it's, cause it's a good question in a way that you may not actually expect. The, the, the Jewish turnout in 19, and Polish turnout in 28 were almost identical, 75%, 73, 75%. The Ukrainian turnout was a little bit under that. What's interesting is the Ukrainian turnout in 1922 was virtually non-existent. And the Ukrainians boycotted the 22 election. And so what we did is we actually throw a variable in there of Ukrainian turnout in 22 as a proxy for nationalism. Where they were more nationalist, they would be less likely to turn out in the face of the nationalist boycott. Right? And it doesn't come up as significant. It's in the, I can go back to the thing, but it's there. You'll believe me. Yeah. Now skepticism. The skepticism is. Um your co-author, that you're using 1928 election data to understand what happens in 1940 and 41. Right. And you yourself pointed to that. In the 1930s, there were very important changes, I don't have to tell you, in both the Jewish and, let's call it, the Polish spheres in Poland. Right. So, for example, by the end of the 1930s, the, in the municipal elections, what, in the four largest Polish cities, more than that. Yes. And there's a complete change Jewish political thinking, right. not behavior, in the 1930s. Right. And I come back to Karen's question. The Polish anti-Semite says, Gigi do Palestine. Right. Well, that's exactly what the Zionists said. You're right. right. Because of your anti-Semitism, we are Zionists. We see that integration is right. impossible. What did you call it? Political assimilation is not an option in Poland. Right. And um, I think the causal arrow more likely, although neither of one of us can prove it, the causal arrow is likely to go from anti-Semitism towards Zionism, right. from Zionism, certainly not from Zionism to anti-Semitism. In fact, for the anti-Semites, Zionism was a good thing. It would right. get the Jews out to Madagascar, or at the minimum, or to Palestine. And I'm a little surprised by your statement that the Ukrainians saw the Bebebeer as Polish nationalists and Detsia and Domowski wanted an ethnically pure Poland. Piłsudski wanted an ethnically diverse Poland as long as the territory would be larger. Right. Why would Ukrainians be more hostile to Bebe to Piłsudski mm -hmm. than mm -hmm. to Detsia? OK. And two more brief points. Um, I very much sympathize with Ashutosh Varshny's work and, and with your attempt. But where violence breaks out, I think, is very often, especially in, in this period that you're talking about in this area, is very often highly contingent. Yeah. And it is difficult, maybe even impossible, to systematize. And I think political scientists ought to resist <laughs> the temptation to systematize that which is not systematic. Um, finally, Said, I hope I'm quoting you correctly. Sure. Where more Jews lived, there were more pogroms. And where more Jews lived, more voted for Jewish parties. More, a greater percentage, a greater of, the, percentage. of those Jews voted for Jewish parties. It was easier to integrate Jews when there were, into Polish parties where there were fewer of them. And so the first statement would not be sufficient to explain pogroms. No. OK. Um, how do you then categorize the movement? 
supposed to be. Right. You have the Petura days, I think, what, June, July, 41? Yeah, July, Ju July. like July 2nd through 5th, something like that. Generally yeah. presented as a Ukrainian pogrom yes. against the Jews. Yes. Does that come into your... It's mind? Ukraine. Ukraine is one of, is one of our cases. Um, but it's not a Polish pogrom. No, it's well. Actually, Ukraine and Borisov are are interesting because Poles do participate in both, but they're not the majority, right? They're not even. So how do you? How do you code it in there? Code yeah, it. I know it's a big problem. I mean, it's a, okay. So these are all good questions. Um, so let me try to address them. This will be your last one. Oh no, it's totally fine. <laughs> um, um, the changes. It is true that Jews, Jews. Um, um, changed their allegiances um, among Jewish parties and between Polish and Jewish parties, I should add, over the course of the 1930s. And as you point out quite correctly, in that crucial 19, in the communal elections of 38, the Bund did very well um, in certain parts of Poland. It did very well. We haven't been able to get that data by the, broken down to the village, or of course we would have used it, right? But it, which is also why I do not I do not stress the Zionist character, the, the, the specifically going to Israel Zionist character. I don't distinguish between the Jabotinskyites and the and the laborites or Poalite Sion. I don't do any of that. It is simply voting for a new kind of assertive Jewish politics. We're here. And we're Jewish, to kind of take a, a <laughs> anything from today's politics into back then. And so they don't. I, I am saying that this is, this is a vote for an assertive Jewish politics in which Jews do not show themselves willing to, to integrate themselves within the dominant Polish nation-building project. Which brings me to Pilsudski, your, your next question. You are correct that in his earlier incarnation, Pilsudski, unlike the, the Endetsia, was willing to have a multinational, even federal. And this was really in 1918-1919. That goes away. That was the original project of the Prometheans. They were going to create, they were going to attract Ukraine. It was going to be the big old Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth in which the Poles would be the, scene, the big brothers and everybody would have their autonomy. That kind of fades. The project of integrating Ukrainians into Polish culture, that is adopted by the Pilsudskiites. Um, Ukraine, the pressure on Ukrainian schools in Galicia is extreme. It never goes away. The only area in which the Pilsudskiites did try to grant temporarily some Ukrainian autonomy was in, was in Volhynia under Henrik Yuzevsky. And Tim Snyder wrote a whole book about this. It's a good book, right? And, but it was very temporary, very abortive, and didn't attract a lot of Ukrainian allegiance. They continued to view the Pilsudskiites as Polish, as Polish. Um, I think that answers your questions, because that was, I didn't, did, did I miss something on the Zionism? Um, I think I, I think I got because I incorporated. I, I said I'm not trying to say Zionist qua qua alia Zionist. I don't think that's what these Zionists were. I mean, you know, I mean, you know better than I do that at that time. I mean, Ben was it was it Weizmann? I think it was Weizmann shows up in Poland in 1927 and says Zionism's dead, right? It's dead. It's just not going to happen. And what the Polish Zionists, when they speak of uh, the, what the Yiddish word is, what doikite, right? Uh, the hearness. Right, that we're going to actually pursue our interests as Zionists here in Poland. That's what Jewish politics really was. And whether it was Bundist or Zionist, I think mattered very little. And the fourth Aliyah and the Grabski, right, and there's right. A continuous but it's the 25,000 people. It's not right. a lot. But there's, uh, well, Hashomer Hatzayo, et cetera, right. are serious about Aliyah. It's true. All right, okay, fine. Thank you. We'll speak <laughs> Thank you very much for a wonderful lecture. Thanks a lot. Anna. Thank you.